Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Amantriya Charananu Gyata. Pariyasya Vivadyadatam. Aruroha Ratam Kaischit. Parishvyato. Parishyavyato vivaditaha. Translation. Afterwards, the Lord asked permission to depart, and the king gave it. The Lord offered his respects to Mara Judasthir by bowing down to his feet, and the king embraced him. After this, the Lord being embraced by others and receiving the obeisances, got into his chariot. Srila Prabhupada's purple. Maharaj Yudhisthira was the elder cousin of Lord Krishna. And therefore, while departing from him, the Lord bowed down at the king's feet. The king embraced him as a younger brother, although the king knew perfectly well that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. Lord takes pleasure when some of his devotees accept him as less important in terms of love. No one is equal then or greater, no one is greater than or equal to the Lord, but he takes pleasure in being treated as younger than his devotees. These are all transcendental pastimes of the Lord. Impersonalists cannot enter into the supernatural roles played by the devotees of the Lord. Thereafter, Bhima and Arjun embraced the Lord because they were of the same age, but Nukul and Sahadev bowed down before the Lord because they were younger than he. Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pucharine Nir Visesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Santarine Panchakalpatu Vishya Kripa Sindhupe Vacha Patitanam Pavane Gyo Vaishnavi Gyo Namaha Namaha Kaisi Krishna Saitanya Pavanatamanda Sri Advaita Gadada Visi Vasa Vibhor Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so one thing we find very much prominent in Vaishnav culture is etiquette. Etiquette or behavior and is so essential that it brings about or destroys devotion. Uh, here, destroys means for those who don't follow etiquette. Uh, it can also subliminate devotion to a lesser role, or even remove it. So uh, etiquette is so important. Um, how one behaves in each and every situation. And there are so many varieties of situations, so that behavior is variegated accordingly. Uh, here we're seeing Lord Sri Krishna showing the perfect etiquette. He's a family member. He plays that role in this particular Leela he is in. Uh, he is uh, he is a cousin of Maharaj Yudhisthira, but he is a younger cousin. So he is an older cousin. So Krishna, noting that, bowed down. Now it's interesting the king embraced him follow the etiquette very nicely, but he also simultaneously knew that Krishna was the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So he pleased Krishna by doing this. The affection was also there, but at the same time, he could have, he could have thought, well, 
this is the Supreme Lord, although he's my younger cousin, how can I embrace him? He should embrace me. But the king, following the etiquette so nicely and taking advantage of the opportunity to become more intimate with the Lord in exchange and to please the Lord, he reciprocated in this way. And you see how important this etiquette is here. And then Prabhupada um, illustrates this by giving examples on how Bhima and Arjuna Kul and Sahadev all uh, show different relationships with the Lord as the Lord was about to leave. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. And there's a prominent example in the life of Madhvacharya. Madhvacharya, when he was, uh, after becoming sufficiently educated in the science of spiritual life, devotional life, he no longer had any interest in staying with the family, nor following the family's uh, direction for him to get married. So he wanted to take sannyas. Um, but he also understood the etiquette was that you need to get permission from your parents. He was a young boy at the time. I think he was about 11 years old. Yes, he was 11 years old. He is asking to take sannyas. They refused. They said, you are only son. How can we, uh, how can you leave us? You know, you should stay with us. And, uh, you know, be a nice son. You can still perform devotional life, but, you know, get married. So the Lord said, well, I mean, the Magacharya said, well, actually, you say I'm the only son, but um, you have another child. And when that child grows a little bit, then I'll leave. And then you'll have a son in the family. So they agreed. So after many years, uh, a son came. And now Madhvacharya again reminded them that please give me permission. And uh, although they had promised, they still couldn't keep their promise. And they said, well, we cannot do that. We cannot live without you. So he, he said, well, you promised and now you have a son and I am going. So, and he started to leave. And both mother and father followed him, begging him to come back. And at one point, uh, his father became so, so overwhelmed that he was thinking, what can I do to bring my son back? So he actually fell flat at the feet of his son and begged him to come back. Now, a father doesn't do that. That's not the etiquette. The father will take obeisances from his son, and that's actually done. We have the example when Srila Prabhupada was initiating uh, Brahmananda in the early days of Krishna consciousness in 26 Second Avenue. Brahmananda's mother was there, and Prabhupada said, you offer your obeisances to your mother, and he did. He got down and he offered his obeisances to his mother. So it, this is etiquette that these children offer respects and obeisances to their parents. And uh, so when uh, Madhavacharya's father bowed down, Madhavacharya immediately said, ha, this proves I'm a sannyasi because uh, a parent will not bow down to his son unless the son is a sannyasi. <laughs> so he took that apparently uh, change in etiquette as the etiquette because you, know, you, you offer your respects by bowing down to a sannyasi, no matter what your relationship is, that is the etiquette. And so, 
And then he said, thank you very much, I'm going. <laughs> and his father had nothing, he could not say anything, he simply left. So you see, uh, etiquette also indicates consciousness and indicates direction in life. It's so uh, really important. You'll read in the, um, it'll come up when Krishna enters, comes back to, um, to uh, Hastinapur, or actually was it Dwarka? No, Hastinapur. Again, when he meets Yudhisthira and all the brothers and everything, um, you'll see how that etiquette plays itself out. I think it's in, go to uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, um, chapter 11, I think it's chapter 11, the uh, first canto, yeah, same first canto, chapter 11, I think it's verse 22, well, Krishna entering into Dwarka, let's see, yeah. Here, the Almighty Lord greeted everyone present by bowing his head, exchanging greetings, embracing, shaking hands, looking and smiling, giving assurances, and awarding benedictions, even to the lowest in rank. So in this, you'll see that the Lord reciprocated according to the different people who were there. So um, he shook hands with some, he exchanged just friendly greetings with others, he embraced with others, he shook hands with others, he looked and smiled to others, uh, gave assurances and benedictions. In other words, in I think there is eight different ways the Lord reciprocated according to the person that he was exchanging relationships with. So the Lord is the epitome or the height of Vaishnav etiquette. He teaches Vaishnav etiquette. <clears throat> Lord Chaitanya did the same thing. When his mother <clears throat> wanted him to not to go to Jagan, to Vrindavan, but to remain in Jagannath Puri. Well, after he had taken sannyas, she said, we cannot bear the idea that we will never see you again. If you go to Vrindavan, we will never see you again. So this is too much. Therefore, please stay in Jagannath Puri and make your base, your sannyas base, in Jagannath Puri. And the Lord agreed because it was the request of his affectionate mother. So he obeyed her by keeping his desire to leave Navadweep, which he did, because that was he had to do that in order to fulfill the, the role of a sannyasi. A sannyasi cannot take or person cannot take the sannyas order of life and then stay within the family or stay within the society that they grow up with. It will not be possible for them to execute their dharma, their role as a sannyasi. So they have to leave and travel and go other, and go other places. Will the Lord fulfill that? But when his mother requested, please, we cannot in any way feel happy knowing that we will never see you again. So please remain in Jagannath Puri. And she said that there are two, two rooms in the same house. So that way we will be able to travel and meet you. And the Lord agreed. <laughs> he agreed to uh, fulfill the desires. In other words, he obeyed his mother, which he considered to be not only his superior, but she had so much affection for him that he followed that. So this Vaishnav etiquette uh, is very, very uh, essential in the execution of devotional service. There are, His Holiness Bhakti Charu Swami was the epitome of Vaishnav etiquette. He was known to be Paka, in all aspects of Vaishnava etiquette. He was actually famous 
for being the example within our Krishna consciousness society as one who followed Vaishnava etiquette to the to the T, to the point of perfection. And every and therefore Vaishnava etiquette, as we see, and Lord Chaitanya also explains that one who follows the etiquette of a Vaishnava, uh, that is their that is their decorations, that is their ornamentations. Uh, because then that is the way that one exhibits their relationships with others in the best and most effective way. So there is, of course, we learn by reading the different principles, there are etiquette in different levels or different areas of one's devotional activity. Vaishnava etiquette in the temple, Vaishnava etiquette in kirtan, Vaishnava etiquette with people in general, Vaishnava etiquette amongst devotees and amongst different types of devotees, Vaishnava etiquette with other spiritual groups, uh, Vaishnava etiquette in taking prasadam. Uh, so all of these, uh, there's a whole long list of categories where Vaishnava etiquette is exhibited in different ways. And this is the, as Lord Chaitanya said, this is the ornament of a devotee. And then he explained <clears throat> uh, what that ornament is actually understand to be, is that if you're dressed very nicely, and along with your dress, you have a particular, say ladies have some flowers in their hair or some beautiful necklace that is there amongst their dress, or a man has a, a flower in his lapel on his uh, on his garment, it stands out. It's noticeable. It's attractive. So now that is the way we understand Vaishnava. It makes the devotee attractive behavior of Vaishnava. Uh, sometimes that is lost due to what we say inconvenience becomes inconvenient to follow the etiquette. There may be emergency situations where the etiquette cannot be followed, but those are rare. Uh, those are rare, say one is, um, say one is uh, out there preaching and one may, I uh, just like we understand like when Prabhupada was giving instructions. One devotee was wanted to preach, or was preaching in Russia. But at the time it was a communist country. He had written a letter to Prabhupada that there's nothing to eat here. <laughs> All there is is meat. I can't find anything to eat. Prabhupada knew because Prabhupada had already gone to Russia prior to that. And Prabhupada wrote back, well, the most important thing is to preach. So if, if you need meat, if you have need food to preach, then eat meat, but preach. <laughs> so that, that is, of course, not a principle we follow. But that was an emergency situation. So sometimes the etiquette is lost due to the need for preaching or like that. Uh, we see the example of... Uh, Srila Haridas Thakur. Haridas Thakur was the epitome of Vaishnava etiquette. Um, Sanatan Goswami glorifies Srila Haridas Thakur by saying, some people preach, but their behavior is not very good or not very much in line. And others, their behavior is very nice, but they don't preach. But Mm, Sanatana Goswami goes on to glorify Haridas Thakur. He says that you are preaching and your behavior is, is the bhaka, the best, expert, is uh, in line with all the qualities of the true Vaishnava. Therefore, you are the best of all Vaishnavas. So when we combine 
our spiritual activities with the activities of etiquette, we find it is very attractive. And it's very, very, it, it brings the element of bhakti to a, to a higher and more satisfying level, the activities of bhakti to a more higher and satisfying level. So you find here how Krishna followed that. Krishna is taking the position of someone who is in a lesser position. Uh, here, another point is being made that it, not in this particular verse, but in the verse that we were reading originally, 1.10.8, where the Lord takes the subordinate position amongst his devotees. I think we should go back to the original verse because there is an interesting point within that uh, purport that sort of illustrates some very important point. And in that point, it says here that the Lord takes pleasure when some of his devotees accept him as less important in terms of love. And then Prabhupada says the, the impersonalist cannot under, under, enter into the supernatural roles played by the, the devotees of the Lord. So uh, this is very special and it's unique. It's not something that anyone can adopt. It's a, it's a level of bhakti and that's the mood of Vrindavan. Because the mood of Vrindavan is that the residents of Vrindavan don't really care or don't really want to know that Krishna is actually the Supreme Lord. They just love Krishna for who he is. And that love takes different forms according to that relationships so and mother Yasoda is in the position of his mother so she ties him up she chastises him for for stealing butter um, in so many ways the lord is in, in in a position of being corrected or being and just like he he plays with his friends and they sometimes they wrestle and krishna loses or sometimes one of his friends will take away his lunch and run away with it, and Krishna will chase after him. <laughs> so the Lord loves this because it's done out of love. And so this, this, and you'll see, <laughs> Prabhupada tells the story how one, um, uh, I forgot his name. There was one minister. He was in he was in India. He was a British minister. I can't remember his name. But he was a he had an important position. So one time one man came to see the uh, it was a, he was a governor, I think. And uh, he asked to see the governor. His secretary said, Well, he's busy right now. You'll just have to wait. Well, the man was sitting there waiting and he waited for a whole hour. After one hour, he was thinking, well, what is the governor doing? So he decided to sneak in and peek inside the door and see what he was doing. And so he did. And what he saw was the governor was on his four, on his hands and knees. And he had his little grandson on his back and he, they were playing horsey together. So here you see, and Prabhupada explains how, you know, he's a, he, he's a big paying people, he's a big person. They honor him, they respect him in so many ways. They treat him in, in that way, but he enjoys playing with his little grandson and becoming the horse of the little kid. <laughs> so you'll find that that's a nature of a living being Sometimes they, lo they love to take a lesser position in a relationship because it's done out of, ha out of love or out of, out of uh, a, a mood of giving satisfaction to each other. But that's very sweet. So that is a certain element and that is the mood of Vrindavan. And as Prabhupada mentions here, your personalists and others cannot enter into this role, nor can they even understand it, how the Lord takes a subordinate position. But Prabhupada cautions us 
not to sometimes su surreptitiously or presumptuously try to jump up to that level. And Prabhupada said, don't come into the temple and jump on the back of the deity and think that you can, you know, have a pastime with Krishna like that, he said. So that is not <clears throat> the way to go. It's, in other words, when one develops that loving relationship with Krishna and love is the mood, then all of these other elements of respect and etiquette, which is always in line according to the relationship, fall away and love becomes the, the exchange. And then that love takes out different, and then Krishna enjoys being in a subordinate position. And uh, uh, the devotees are pleasing Krishna in that way. So, but that, that is done only on, on Raganuga Bhakti or spontaneous devotional service. It can't be done for those who are still practicing rules and regulations and are engaged in the regulated devotional service. This is spontaneous loving. And it's the mood of Vrindavan. So here, even though this is not Vrindavan, this is Hastinapur. <laughs> um, Krishna follows the etiquette so nicely and takes a lesser position. So he does that with his loving devotees, no matter where they are. That, that is Krishna. And so he's teaching by example that one should follow the etiquette, but at the same time, the, high, the, the principle that makes the relationship wonderful, which is the goal of devotional service, is to serve Krishna in love. Like that. And, uh, you know, Radharani, she ignores him sometimes. She gets, she gets angry with him sometimes, but Krishna likes that. <laughs> it's part of that loving relationship. Uh, okay, so uh, we will conclude here and open it up for discussion. Thank you so much, Maharaj for such a sweet class on Krishna's and how he deals with different devotees at different levels and how we should not try to even imitate some of them because like you were mentioning that we can't jump on the back of the deities. <laughs> that was, we can't imitate that. <laughs> Would like That's to right. ask devotees if you have any questions, any comments, clarification, uh, please uh, you know, do uh, either raise your hand or you can just jump right in and I will, um, call upon you. I'm going down the list. We have a good amount of devotees today. It was very nice. We got about 35 devotees online, Maharaj. So, yeah, Amar, nice. would you like me to get the verse out so we can go to the gallery? Please. Mm -hmm. Sure, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. So, if, if there are any questions, any comments, please. Uh, do raise your hand or you can just jump right in and I will call upon you. Marge, I have a question as you were speaking and what came to my mind is um, this phrase that we always hear, familiarity breeds contempt. How does that play with Vaishnav etiquette? Marge, what in terms of the relation, you know, the relation between the both? Well, um, that's one of the reasons we follow the etiquette is it, co it causes, it doesn't allow that contempt to at least develop. If we all, and then you'll see that all of that, that Vaishnava rela relationship is based on the principle of respect. As soon as we lose respect, then the whole thing is lost. <laughs> So uh, that uh, familiarity breeds contempt also means a loss of respect that, lose, that leads to that. If we keep that respectful relationship and that you'll see that happens many times when people get very familiar with each other. And then when that familiarity comes and the respect is lost. Uh, so therefore, one has to keep that respectful. Uh, and Bhakti Vinod emphasizes that 
in his preaching where he says, somehow or other, I go, I go on in life because I give respects to everyone. Yeah. So that is the um, principle of devotion. And it's, it's the mindset of a devotee that devotee respects everyone because in the heart of every living entity, Krishna sits. So when we disrespect or offend another person, that is also going towards Krishna, who sits in the heart of that living entity. So yeah, keep that respectful attitude. Um, and that also means to learn how to act and speak within a particular situation. If we lose respect, um, yeah. But of course, certain relationships do become very familiar and friendly and sometimes very casual. But as soon as the respect is lost, then the quality of that relationship will start to be lost also. Even when the familiarity is there or the, the casual, casualness is there, the respect should not be lost. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. That was a key point that I never really understood that way is the foundation of the of the phrase familiarity breeds contempt is based on respect. Thank you so much. Mother Gita, please, Mother. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All grace to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you. Maharaj, my question is if uh, sometimes if the devotee uh, unknowingly forgets the etiquette. Does that become an offense to us, that devotee? It can be. It may not be, but it can be. It depends on what happens. Just by neglecting the etiquette, it's not necessarily offense. But if that neglect causes one to act and speak in the wrong way, that could lead to an offense. Thank you, yeah, but not necessarily like that, because we do that. We have a, sometimes we forget that the etiquette that is there, and uh, we start to act normally. We get involved with the activity and forget about the relationship that the activity is based on, and then we may say or do something that we don't really mean or doesn't fit the situation. Uh, yeah, this is something we have to constantly be aware of because we're always in contact with people. Okay. Like one of my problems is I, I like to tell jokes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that breaches the etiquette because people don't appreciate my jokes. Or the jokes are, it's not so much they don't appreciate, they may be out of context with the, with the particular situation. And if it then that happens, then people will misunderstand and then all of a sudden the relationship turns into something different. But it depends, you know, it depends how intimate you are with that person. Prabhupada talks about the relationship between the grandson and the grandfather. He said, in Vedic culture, okay, he says, in, in, no, it's just in human culture, he says that sometimes the grandson will criticize the grandfather. But he said, that goes on, that's normal. <laughs> it seems like that is allowable due to that relationship. Or the granddaughter will do that to the grandmother. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Any questions from devotees? There's always exceptions to everything <laughs> based on circumstance.
Thank you, Marge. Sukhavaha Mataji, please go ahead. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and all glories to your lotus feet. Guru Maharaj, I just wanted to ask you that um, certain relationships, we if we keep a respect, then there is a lot of distance between uh, two people when there is a respect is there. So how how to maintain the balance of keeping a respect but not being too away from in the relationship as well? Mm, well, the, the, you, you act within the relationship. That is the essential thing. But in your mind and heart, you're not minimizing the importance of that person. In other words, uh, mm, there's, what is it? Three principles of knowledge. Um, the three principles of knowledge, as Prabhupada describes, it's not like what we think they are. The three principles of knowledge are one, to see every woman except one's wife as mother, to see everyone's possession and any, any, everyone else's possession is simply garbage in the street. In other words, you don't touch it. It doesn't belong to you. And the third one is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We call that the golden rule, but that's the third principle that makes up these three principles of knowledge. So one who follows these three are considered to be a knowledgeable person. So we want respect for ourselves or in a relationship, if that respect is lost, the relationship gravitates down to something ordinary or the, the, the goal of the relationship somehow gets lost. Uh, the goal of the relationship may be to accomplish something. And when you work with others in order to accomplish something, uh, if you try to somehow or other uh, breach the etiquette or don't follow the etiquette, you minimize the, per the other person's role within that relationship. And uh, a person will also feel that also. So, I mean, there are so many um, considerations and there are so many variables in this. Um, but even if someone just like, I, <laughs> I was just saying in class this morning that, uh, you know, people who come from New York, you know, they're a little bit rough around the edges. <laughs> Externally, if you know New Yorkers, they're, they're kind of rough, right? Yeah, I mean, honestly, you know. But generally, New Yorkers are very soft inside and very rough on the outside. <laughs> so if you, if you only see the, the outside, then you, you miss the actual person. But they relate to each other in that same way. They can be kind of rough with each other, but there's no mean spirit in that roughness. It's just their nature. That's all. So then, I mean, that's street etiquette, but that's the way it is in a certain area of the world. Mm -hmm. If you try to do that in California, it won't work. Because <laughs> the, the mood is different there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, so etiquette, I think the foundation to the essence of all varieties of etiquette is the respect principle. That has to be there because as soon as we lose respect, then things start going in a different direction. We minimize the person, we minimize the relationship, we minimize the activities. You can't serve Krishna unless you have some respect for him. <laughs> A lot of respect for Krishna. 
Yes, uh, a son may disagree with his mother, but he still has respect for his mother. Thank you, Maharaj. Mother Sri Devi, please. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you, Anisya. Please accept my humble obeisance to your Guru Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your divine lotus feet. On the subject of etiquette, Guru Maharaj, if I may just humbly submit some observations and ask for your kind guidance. There are some people, devotees even, you know, quite, quite senior, but um, their behavior is uh, sometimes, you know, really very vexing. And you start thinking, why is this person behaving like this? And, uh, or they make uh, so much demands on your time or your energy. And then you're left wondering if they're going to do this again and again, how can I continue to offer that same, you know, humble, respectful obeisances and respect and all? Because this person seems to think just because I'm being humble, respectful, that they can, uh, you know, uh, demands on my time and energy just because of that. And then you notice that other people just avoid them or shun them or run away. And you're the only one sitting there, like a sitting down. So, I mean, this actually happened to me. That's why I'm saying this. Mataji would come and she would just start talking, 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 unload all her troubles, everything. And then I'm sitting over there saying, okay, I have to listen. This Mataji may not have any friends. <laughs> I must you know, pay attention and, you know, I, I just want to be there for her like that. So, but after some time, you find that everybody else is running away from them and you're, you're the one who's getting caught every time. So, and... Well, I mean, you can be, you have to use your intelligence to somehow or other change the mood and in order to keep the relationship going or to keep the conversation going and so mm -hmm. if you can do that you may also change the way that they uh, are relating to you uh, and that way you're keeping respect and at the same time you're, you're making a point that maybe we should take the same conversation in a different direction but you can do that if you're you just listen to what they say like if they're complaining about others generally when you're complaining about others it's you're trying to dump your ideas about someone else onto another person who has doesn't have the same relationship that you have with that person so that's offensive That's offensive. I was just reading that yesterday uh, and when, when I was reading a, a particular book it was mentioning that people will come and complain about others to you. You may not even know so much about the person, but they just want you to feel like they to fortify their own feelings towards that person. And so they're looking for association in the same way, but that's offensive. So what you can do is you can either excuse yourself or you can start talking about the good points of that same person. <laughs> and it becomes, when you start talking about the good points of that person, and then it becomes obvious to them that they don't want to hear, you know, you don't want to hear their negativity, the negativity they're giving you. Now they might be offended against you and think, oh, Oh boy, what happened here? So they'll leave. <laughs> or they may actually start, if you, if you do it in such a way, they might actually change. Hmm. That happened to me. Somebody was really <laughs> complaining about someone to me, someone who was very close to me. And uh, I just tolerated it. And somehow, a person got to the point 
of realizing that they were wrong. <laughs> so you have, I don't know, you have to see the situation. Uh, there was no nothing else I could do. I could go away and I would have left that same, that person with the same attitude towards that person. Or I could argue with them, but I saw that my attempt to argue with them would just make the situation go in the same direction. It wouldn't get any better, get, maybe even get tolerated it. And then I said a few things that were positive and that somehow or other it worked. That's an example, I'm not saying it's gonna work in all situations. But then again, if you wanna help that person, you can help them by you know, changing it to a po something positive or you can somehow excuse yourself. But if, you say, if you're just sitting there listening to that person go on and you're miserable and they're just dumping it on you, it's just, it's, nobody's benefiting. Right, right. So in such a situation, tolerance is not the, not the way to go. I can turn the conversation to something which will benefit her and me by putting- Or just change, just change the subject completely. You know? Hmm. Hmm. Just look for a word that they're saying and then take that word and turn it into another conversation. And what to do if someone is very emotionally needy, they just want to come and they want to talk, talk, talk about many, many things with no end in sight. <laughs> you know what to do with that. You're a counselor. <laughs> okay. You can give you can you can give instructions on that one. Again, you have to see what is my relationship to, with that person. That's all. If they're coming to you for for help, then that tolerance is needed. In a counseling session, Guru Maharaj, I know what to do, but I'm talking about people, you know, just in the temple, they're meeting you walking down the stairs and you're walking up the stairs and they just catch you and they start off. And then uh, what are you supposed to do? Just gently excuse yourself and keep going like that? I find but myself... I don't, I don't want to make offenses, that's why. Yeah, you can say, excuse me, I have to go to the toilet or <laughs> something. <laughs> Okay. In other words, you want to you want to get out of there. <laughs> uh, or you can say, uh, uh, like sometimes people will start talking in the middle of a, in the middle of a, you know, Tulsi prayers are going on or kirtans going on, and they start. And I just say, uh, you know, I, I just make the point straight that, you know, this is where we should be focusing on what's going on. That was a very nice question, Sri Devi, because as you were asking, I was remembering a situation that I had three, four years ago. I don't know this person. She came up to me and started talking about the temple president. And I just listened and, you know, switched it around. And since then, she doesn't like me, which is not my concern right now. <laughs> because I, but yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's interesting how much we go through that because they just want to, and I think March, the, uh, what came to mind is they just want a soundboard. Yeah. Yeah. When they want somebody to support their feelings. If someone comes up with you with a problem about someone else and they, they want to know an answer, that's one thing. But if they want to bring you onto their mindset, that's a whole different thing. Marsh, you just touched on a point, you know, that I think is a challenge for many people, whether we are devotees or not, I think, is, um, you know, they are coming to us with, with with an answer versus coming to us to 
you know, uh, to dump, you know, like a dumping zone. And as devotees, how can we um, differentiate the point that, okay, am I coming for answer? And by saying, you know, blah, 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 all these issues with somebody, or am I looking for someone just to dump my crap so that they can be on my side? Like, how can we be aware of that? You're talking about oneself, right? Yes, Maharaj. Well, just don't do it. <laughs> That's what I would say. <laughs> if, if you're going to approach, if you have, have a problem or you have some concern, you have, to, you have to introduce what you're going to say to a person ahead of time to get their agreement and confidence before you start talking. Like I have, and you might say, well, I need a little bit of your time. I have this concern. Um, can we discuss it? You have to say something introductory rather than just, you know, letting it fly. Thank you, Maharaj. And yes, much. I have to agree that Bhaktachura Swami was the, was the epitome of Vaishnav etiquette. Oh yeah, par excellence. Par excellence. Yes, and and I follow, and I always have his handbook. You know, the, he he has a manual. That's the word, manual. Um, downloaded in my laptop, and I I go to that quite a bit because sometimes we tend to, uh, I feel tend to like wash it down or dwindle it or minimize it, and it's always good to be reminded the proper etiquette that way. And I. Really like the point, Marsh, that you said where, you know, it's the principle is respect. That way we don't uh, lose the, the respect, uh, the foundation of respect, which I think is so important because it's such a fine line. It's such a fine line that we're not even aware that we are not respecting someone. Like when, like when Mother Gita was asking a question, like what if someone... Um, purposely knowingly you know do not greet a devotee don't acknowledge a devotee and you know but acts like it's all okay you know like like that that respect foundation is completely Res gone yeah respect has the ingredients of trying to understand the feelings of others and not just act in your own capacity without that when you're when you're when you're giving respects to other, you try to be sensitive to that person, their feelings, their position, the relationship you have with them. That's the that's some of the elements that make up respect. If you're not sensitive to that, then you'll you'll act and you'll you'll act out of respect out of disrespect or without respect. So Marge, is, it's completely a heart-to-heart -heart connection, even when it comes to respect, in terms of understanding the feelings. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's, that's human culture, but that's Vedic culture, which teaches what is human culture. Yeah. So one of the things we do, which kind of shows respects, is that we always, we offer the pranams by folding our hands, it's not something we should just do, you know, perfunctory or presumptuously or routinely. We should do that with feeling when we do that. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you for such a wonderful answer. Any questions from devotees? Any, um, you know, clarification that you would like to ask? Please do raise your hand or you can just jump right in. I'm just going down because we got a lot of devotees. It is so, so nice. I'm just going, I'm scrolling so that I don't miss anybody here. Yes, dear Krishna, go ahead. Hare Krishna, uh, Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisances. All grief to Srila Prabhupada, all grief to you. Thank you for <clears throat> wonderful class, wonderful points. Maharaj, one question I have is, uh, one aspect is 
how we should offer respect to other devotees <clears throat> based on their position and our relationship with them at the same time if uh, like i am a conditioned soul so if somebody i feel is not respecting me how should i handle it um um practically oh, Lord Chaitanya teaches us that one should not ask for respect for oneself. And one should give respect to others. He doesn't qualify that beyond that point. Now that's, that may be difficult. We find it's easier to give respect to others than to act in such a way that when you don't get respect, you still are not disturbed by that situation. And that's, that's what... That's the principle of humility, and it's a principle of pridelessness. It's a principle that allows one to chant the holy names more easily. Yeah. Now, you might say, well, of course, if you're in a relationship, and that continues to happen, obviously the relationship is going to gravitate down. So, you know, if the husband doesn't respect the wife, but the wife respects the husband, after a while the wife is going to start losing her respect for the husband. Because there's somewhat of a relationship where people are expected to act accordingly in order to build that relationship, to develop that relationship, to uh, seek the goal of that relationship. But Lord Chaitanya doesn't even talk about that. All he says is, you know, amanina amanadena. Give respect and don't ask for respect in return. That is can be done when you are, when we say, occasionally in a, uh, in, in a situation where you're with that person. But if you're with that person all the time, say it's someone that's very close to you in a relationship, as soon as that respect is lost on one side, it's going to affect the whole relationship. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, uh, piggybacking on Dear Krishna's question is, um, we hear and we are taught, you know, uh, not to expect respect, and we just give it, you know, regardless. What is the, is there a boundary, you know, when we continue to give respect to someone who literally don't want it? <laughs> like, I've experienced that literally, like literally don't even look at you when you want to offer something like they just walk away. Yeah, I do that too. <laughs> so yeah, what can you do? Um, but that person who has been given respect, they should in their mind, take that, take that, uh, Respect and offer it to their spiritual master. And that is the actual etiquette or the behavior that they take it and offer it to the spiritual master, they offer it to Krishna. Somebody's offering you obeisances, and you, you, you just think, my dear Krishna, this, these obeisances I offer to you. Because if you keep accepting respect, you're going to start feeling that you actually deserve it. <laughs> actually, Marge, I was talking about someone who's not uh, not wanting to accept it, but in a mood of arrogance or grudge or relationship issue, like, you know, I don't want your respect because I don't like you kind of a thing. That's, But we still continue to give it, but they're like, I don't want to deal with you. <laughs> And then just don't deal with them. <laughs> Stop giving them respect. Stop, you know, yeah. 
why waste time with that? And you can see it's not going anywhere. I got my answer, Maharaj. Thank you. <laughs> Namrata, please go ahead. My Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. A glorious to Shula Prabhupada. Maharaj, I uh, just wanted to make uh, a difference. Uh, I wanted to know the difference between the self respect and uh, uh, when we should not expect respect. So, uh, since you gave the example of a husband and wife, so. Uh, here I saw I see many examples where uh, where the couples are you know just dragging the relationship. Either of the person is uh, you know uh, disrespecting their spouse for the for the years and years, and that uh, other spouse is in the name of uh, maintaining the relationship of. Um, of uh, the of their relationship they they just continue they just drag the relationship and uh, because it is the duty of one of the spouse to give a respect they do it and then it end up changing their nature it end up changing a lot of things in them because not, of that this is not healthy obviously Yeah, if a person is uh, just tolerating it after some time in order to keep the relationship going, that person will find themselves changing in that relationship in order to somehow or other continue in that relationship. But there isn't, when, you, when you're not connecting with people in a positive way, you don't really have a relationship with that person. You have a relationship with the mind, which is not the person. And that's not a real relationship. The relationship is based on values, on goals. Now, those goals and values are being abridged or destroyed because there is a lack of respect, then obviously the goal of that relationship is also going to be lost. Just like in a husband and wife, they're meant to work together, keeping Krishna in the center in order to, so they both can make advancement on the path of devotional service. So there's a responsibility from each side. So if one is not fulfilling that responsibility, the other one, as you say, is dragging the relationship. Yeah. Get the door. But something has to change. There has to be some amelioration in order to bring things back to where it should be. Sometimes we call that counseling. Mm -hmm or marriage counseling and uh, advisory, something has to come in such a way as to change the situation. Otherwise, if it's going down, then eventually the other person is going to lose respect for the person and then, then everything's gone. Then that person will look for a relationship with another person, and that's what happens a lot. There are a lot of extra marriageable, marriageable relationships that go on because there's problems in the initial relationship, <laughs> and that that becomes sinful. Who was that? Hmm? Who? Hmm. Uh, okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. And so that can't go on. Something has to change. Mm -hmm. And it will change automatically by itself if you keep dragging the relationship.
if you see there's some hope that that somebody that by dragging the relationship the person who is acting disrespectful will change then you can you continue to drag it for a while and how long can you drag it <laughs> So Maharaj, uh, here I've seen examples where, uh, especially in the Indian culture, where wives are dragging the relationship for like the lifetime, even if they are not getting respect from their husband or maybe vice yeah. versa. Yeah, because the Indian culture doesn't follow the principle of divorce and separation. So it's never been there until the modern society started to introduce them. So that is still there, or for economic reasons, people stay together, or for the sake of the children, they tolerate the relationship. <laughs> so the children don't get become, you know, a one parent children child, you know. So um, yes, something has to change, obviously. So you so may go on. It may go on for a while, but you can't go on forever. Something has to has to change for the better. Okay, so so ideally, counseling should be there in this in such kind of things. Sri Devi, cannot... Sri Devi is an expert counselor. She deals with all of this all the time. She probably can give so many examples of what we're speaking about. Yes, right, Co correct. I can give many examples where things are going wrong, Guru Maharaj, but I cannot claim anything else beyond that point <laughs> that I'm able to do anything very much because most of the time they come when the marriage is practically irretrievable, you know, or the wife has put up with so much for so long that she practically wants to kill the husband. <laughs> She has put up with so much abuse and so much insults and so much exploitation and things like that. Actually, I was just going to ask a question as a follow-up from Namrata, but I'll wait for Namrata to finish. The person who's dragging the relationship can also use the principle that maybe the, there is a lack of communication. Because of that, this is what's happening or it is a misunderstanding in the communication that has caused this relationship to be somewhat, uh, what we say, going in a different direction, going in the wrong direction. So we, a lot of times, and I say that a lot of times is a, a lack of communication or a misunderstanding between, because a lot of times you as, we assume things in a relationship and sometimes that assumption leads to um, wrong activity, wrong speech. Give me an example. This is a live example. The husband and wife are fighting. They want to run the verge of breaking up. Now they decide to go to a marriage counselor and see if they could save it. So the marriage counselor starts asking some questions. Finally, he gets to the point of asking the husband, what is it about your wife that is so disturbing? And then finally he admits it. He says that she bakes bread. And when she bakes bread, she cuts it up and she always gives me the end piece and she keeps the other piece for herself. This is a live story. This is a real marriage. I'm not making this up. Uh, and then, uh, then the counselor investigated a little bit farther and found out and the lady admitted that well, actually, I gave him the end piece because I thought the end piece is the best piece. And the reason why she said that, she came, she comes from an Italian background. So in the Italian culture, if you give the end piece, that is considered to be the best piece. 
But he didn't understand that. And therefore, he concluded, because she gives me the end piece, she doesn't love me. This was his conclusion. And that led to so many other misunderstandings. So it took a while for the counselor to get to the essence, but then he found it that he just misunderstood his wife. And she wasn't able to make him understand either for whatever reason. <laughs> so yeah, misunderstanding, miscommunication, wrong understanding. That's why that we say that before you get married, you should know the person quite well before you get married. Before you, then there's a lot of surprises that may pop up later and then it's too late. That's why they, we call it in Western society, one gets engaged. But now people don't, don't even do that. There's no such thing. All they do is like, agree based on physical attraction or similar likes in life to get married they don't get married they just live together and things change things change physical attraction wears off this is a this is statistic physical attraction wears off between two and three years it's gone you better have something else in that relationship that is the foundation that makes that relationship. And that when we talk about the bodhis, that foundation is the principles of Krishna consciousness. So these principles are, are the deciding factor to bring back the relationship. That if both persons are devotees, then they should understand that in order to make the relationship work, we have to live according to the principles that govern Krihasta Ashram. If we don't follow those principles, we create new principles or adjust the main principles, we're going to find it's going to, not going to be as, you know, we're going to run into other problems. It's just the way it is. So, yeah. So, this premaritable uh, get to know each other program is important. <laughs> it's very important. Thank you, Maharaj. I think the uh, counseling is what uh, you said is very important. Apart from that, I feel Krishna conscious counseling is more important for them. Yeah, because, because it includes Krishna in it. Yes, Maharaj. It, it will come from Shastras. That is what I feel. Yeah. Uh, because there are many material counselors, but I don't think uh, there are so many complicated cases that only Krishna conscious or Shastra based uh, counseling can only help, I guess. What does Vedic culture say about what, what should bring two people together? And it says nature and liking. When the natures are similar, when the likings are similar. These two factors have to be in place, and then you are, you have a, a a good start in that relationship. If one of those two is not in place, then you're gonna have then it perhaps you have to really work to make that relationship develop in the right way. Liking means we're both devotees. We both like Krishna. We're both you know. And nature means well, when one has to learn. Usually we do that through astrology or through observation given by seniors. What is the nature? Sometimes people will say, what do you think of this relationship? And I look at it and I say, it's not going to work. <laughs> you can just see it. <laughs> Their natures are opposite or contrary. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, you very much. The, if you read the 15th chapter, I think it's the 15th, maybe not. It's the third canto, somewhere in the third canto. I could find it on my listing here. It's a whole series of 
Kardama Muni and Devahuti. You yeah. read that particular pastime, you'll see what are the preliminary principles that set the stage for a, a, a successful relationship. But we don't do that. We get attracted by, you know, material gain or some physical attraction. That's all. Physical attraction will not carry through the relationship. It just doesn't work. You know? Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Vivo. Very nice question, Namrata, I have to say, because that has always been a challenge, you know, as, you know so thank you for bringing that up. Sri Devi, please go ahead. Thank you, Anasya. Guru Maharaj, I just want to ask this for my own understanding and um, maybe edification and guidance that I know the Indian culture, and I totally, totally agree, marriage is a very sacred thing. And women in Indian culture have put up with so much, stayed in the marriage, which is very difficult, put up with so much abuse, et cetera, et cetera, for the sake of the children. Is it that the children who have seen their mother being abused, now they have this template that this is normal. So they go on to have abusive marriages or they accept abuse as normal because that's all they know. I'm telling this from my own personal experience also. Right, and, right. And, yeah. and then the poor, uh, uh, the poor lady, once the children grow up and they understand so many things, they start accusing the mother. Why did you stay with this abusive man? Why did you let us uh, you know, go through so much horrors? Why you couldn't uh, branch off and take care of us properly? Why you subjected us to a... I mean, so it's like a catch-22, you know? The poor lady stayed in it putting up with so much because she held a marriage to be safe. <laughs> well, it works both ways, too. Sometimes the lady abuses the husband, too. Sorry? Sometimes the lady abuses the husband, too, you know. Right, right. Yeah. Right. yeah. I'm just going to make sure we balance this out properly. Here. <laughs> <laughs> but the majority of cases is the other way around, Guru Maharaj. I know there's a small number of growing... I mean, there is a large, not small, quite a significant number of men who are being abused and they are coming to me for counseling. But in the vast majority of cases, it's the women who are being abused. Well, women are more sensitive and therefore it's easier on that level. Man can shake it off sometimes, but women, women can't shake it off. They internalize things fast. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it's an impression. And I also say about the Indian culture, the Indian culture is like, it's like a clay pot. And once you break it, you can't fix it. <laughs> so that's just, there's a lot of sensitivity there, but now, Indian culture is supposed to be Vedic culture. There's no such thing as, you know, it's sort of branched out into now what is called Indian culture, but it's, uh, it comes from the Vedic culture. In fact, all cultures stem from the Vedic culture, but we have induced economic development as part of the relationships uh, there since that has come in, sense gratification and economic development then you have a whole nother dynamic to work with in order to try to iron out the thing. But it comes back to following religious principles. These were, if, if you want to re-straighten the situation out, you have to, again, uh, investigate religious principles and see how they can be applied because they're religious principles for every ashram. And if we don't follow them, then we're, you know, we're on, an, on the ocean with many waves. Mm -hmm. Have to follow religious principles. 
these principles are meant to fortify the relationship and to direct, direct the relationship towards devotion. Material relationships will always be fraught with problems. When you bring Krishna into it, then you can be free from that. Then you can have a happy relationship. God has to be there. He has to be the center. But isn't it the duty of the parent who, to also take care of the children nicely and not subject them to, you know, witnessing all kinds of horrible things and protect the children from uh, secondary trauma because not only now she is getting affected, her children are getting affected too. Yeah, that's true. What you say is correct, yeah. So what so is the what is your conclusion? The conclusion is my conclusion the, is that whatever is in the best interest of everyone's Krishna consciousness that has to take place. If the children it, the wife are being abused to such an extent that she's going crazy, she cannot chant her around, she cannot feel safe, the children are in a mess, then I think that they should be separated from the abusive father and they should. But on the other hand, then the children do without a father and the woman is unprotected. So I don't want to take decisions for them, but I'm asking what is in the best interest of the, of the, the woman and the child in such a situation? Yeah, you, you have to see what are the vested interests in both parties and make that a point of discussion also. If, you know, if one party is just considering their own interests and not the interests of the other party, you can't really come up with any solution. It has to be balanced. That's what a counselor is supposed to do. Seeing what's in common and build on that in common interest. We keep Krishna in the center. If you're trying to straighten out a situation simply using secular principles or what the society, I mean, society have written thousands of books on this, you think that the society is any better off than it is? <laughs> it's not, because they're missing the main point, Krishna. Those, he, those who pray together stay together. Prabhupada says, four activities of the Grihastas. One, chant the rounds together. Two, take prasadam together. Three, read Krishna book together. Four, worship your deity together. He said, do these four things. You can read that. It's in Srimad Bhagavatam. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Bhagavad Gita, chapter 13, verses 8 through 12, the items of knowledge. Prabhupada talks about this uh, family life. It's a very long purport. But one of the one of the parts of the purport, he mentions these four principles. So every, every situation has to be very carefully evaluated, um, you know, case by case, and all aspects have to be seen. Maybe their spiritual masters need to be consulted. And then uh, the young... No, 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 no. Spiritual masters can't get involved with family crises. Mm -hmm. Forget it. Because... Mm, Maybe other senior I, Brihasta couples. To mentor and, them. It's senior degree has the couples or designated persons who have that service. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Um, 
Uh, Anasuya. Yes, Prabhu. Yeah, I mean, yes, Maharaj, sorry. Anasuya, was that Anasuya from Boston? She asked a question. Oh, wait, I just missed it. Let me check. Oh, yeah. She asked for the verse again. It's Bhagavad Gita, chapter 13, verses 8 through 12. Yeah, in the purport. In the later part of the purport, I think it is. Yeah. Oops, I meant to send that to all. I'm sorry, Anasuya, give me one second. I'm going to um, post it to the whole group here. There we go. Okay. Um, question from Kanjanavja Prabhu, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, good set my humble obeisances, all glory to Srila Prabhupada, all glory to you Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, I just wanted to follow up on the questions that um, we've been hearing so far. Um, I was just wondering, because the other day when we were hearing um, Maharaj was saying about enjoying the struggle or taking pleasure in the struggle, and sometimes in family life, it's it's a struggle, and one one partner wants to practice Krishna consciousness, the other partner um, isn't so keen anymore in practicing Krishna consciousness, and so many difficulties arise that have been discussed so far by um, by the various devotees. So I'm just trying to think, Marge, how how at what point do we see it that this struggle is a struggle we should be taking pleasure in um, and trying to do our dharma? And at what point is this struggle really not fruitful? Well, when you see that the other person is not on the same page, they don't want to make any changes. Then what can you do? In this particular case, if both recognize that there is a problem and then there is a struggle to overcome the problem, at least you're, you're in the right position to move forward and you can bring in what you need. To, uh, to help ameliorate, to overcome, to move forward. But if one person is just making the effort and the other person's not cooperating or doesn't recognize there's a problem, then it's, then how, what can you do? You know, I mean, it's like both have to recognize that there needs to be some change or some effort to bring the relationship back to where it should be or bring it to a higher level. And there's where counseling comes in because the counselor will not take sides and will, will, will give responsibility to both persons uh, in bringing about a solution and not just one person. Through their evaluation of counseling, they'll see that, well, this is the situation, and this is what needs to be done. And then that includes both persons. Mm. Okay. And, and if one partner just doesn't want to listen to what the counselor says, um, and, and, the other, and so one person, one partner doesn't want to listen, the other partner does, and then one partner wants to try and make it work for the children. The other partner is just being, you know, just, just being difficult. Doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't see that there's a problem. The other person yeah. doesn't see there's a problem. Yeah. They have to be, they have to recognize that there is a problem. <laughs> That's where counseling comes in. Help them recognize that, yeah, it's going to take both of you to... Uh, to uh, understand that there is some change to be needed. If one person is not happy, then the other person should think, should, should think, well, what is it about the, that person that's not happy? But the other person will think, I'm okay. It's your problem. You got to get it together. And then what will happen? Well, that, that other person can't see that and they're being, you know, pulled in that marriage. So how, like, we, like we mentioned before, how long can someone drag that? It can drag on for some time. Sometimes it drags on for years. But then again, what is that relationship? Mm. We're trying to bring Krishna back into the center. Okay. Sometimes the person who's not been able to recognize 
uh, you can do, you may, you, a person who is being, who is dragging a relationship may change their way of relating to that person in order to wake that person up <laughs> to the fact that there is a problem. That way that other person doesn't take it for granted that everything is okay and, and, that, and the other person is the only one that has to change and not me. Okay. So I think it comes back to what you said before, Marge, that some change has to happen. Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. Okay. yeah. Something, some awareness that there is some need to uh, adjust things. <laughs> Just attitudes, just activities. That's why we put marriage counseling on a very high platform. It's very important that they, we do have counselors in our society who are quite good. Um, you know, I know a few, I know a very expert counselor in California. I also know one in London. Uh, there's so many that are so good at this. I mean, it's a real art. They have, they know the art really good. They know how to get to the essence of the problem and make it aware. Then it requires people to change. If you go to a counselor, you can't say, well, that counselor's wrong. <laughs> you have to take the advice of the counselor. Otherwise, what's the use of coming to a council? Mm. Mm. There's a stupid thing, there's a stu stupid thing that I heard, and this is really kind of stupid, but it indicates how people can't hear. Uh, one husband and wife are fighting, so they went to the counselor. The counselor said, um, and it, was, it wasn't enough, but it was a practical point. He said that, he said to the wife, you should see yourself as the, the servant of your husband. And he told the husband, you should see yourself as the servant of the wife. Now, when you look at it, it's very simple, but it's very profound at the same time. Now, when they went home, uh, they started fighting again. And what they were saying to each other was, don't you understand? You're my servant. No, you're, you're my servant. <laughs> but I got it backwards, you know. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Marge. It reminds me sometimes we, we hear a class and we're looking and we hear we hear something and we're thinking this other devotee needs to change and the other devotee needs to change. When we're hearing a class, we should hear about how ourselves should change. So I think that's a nice example of that. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says, if the, if the faults of others disturb you, look inside yourself and see what about yourself is causing that disturbance. Mm. Thank you, Marge. Hey. Thank you for a nice question, Prabhu. Vrindavan Nath Prabhu, please go ahead. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. So, Guru Maharaj, we, as we have been discussing today on like partly in this uh, relationship uh, things, I, and this question comes uh, in various discussions also uh, yeah, yeah. about uh, what Prabhupada mentioned about uh, uh, Mataji and Prabhuji uh, in terms of maturity relationships and uh, feminism and all these things. And I like my understanding based on Prabhupada various lectures and interview is that Prabhupada very clearly mentioned that uh, men and women have different uh, uh, like uh, responsibility, different services, um, what men can do, me women cannot do, what women can do, men cannot do. So that's one thing we should, rather than thinking equality, we should think how best we can do our services, which has been provided as per Vedic culture. Yeah. And second, that that's a good point. I like to comment on that. But you you find you find modern material society has up, uprooted that whole concept and changed the roles both 
not only change the roles, but change the whole mentality that goes with the roles. And so women, men are acting like women and women are acting like men. True Guru Maharaj. And like one another point, Guru Maharaj, I have observed, uh, Prabhupada's view was that as per Vedic culture, of course, in the modern society, people will not like to hear, uh, not like to agree to those points. But his view was that if Mataji are doing home services, like taking care of children, taking care of family, taking this is a full-time work. And when children are properly taken care, many things will be managed uh, in a different way. But in the modern society, because we are moving away from Vedic culture, Everybody would like equality. Everybody would like no tolerance, no patience, no compromise. That's why there are lots of frictions and people feel uh, like things are not going right. But yes, like it's difficult, like it needs some balance. But probably it's because of everybody feels that yes, like I need to have an equal right. Like I have heard this in many families that uh, when uh, men, women coming off a job, they say, I don't need to cook. I don't need to take care of anything. Like I am also tired and a lot of frictions comes because of like, because yeah. we are moving away from Vedic cultures and we want to adopt all these Western cultures. And you can't help it. You're right in the midst of it. <laughs> well, you can help it by creating the environment. As Srila Prabhupada said, devotees should live together, work together, serve together and pull yourself away from the whole influence of the, uh, from secular demoniac society. It's not just secular, it's soul killing at the same time. But Prabhupada encouraged that, that we need to create, you know, a society within the society based on spiritual values and devotion to Krishna. That's Prabhupada's plan. If we don't do it amongst ourselves, how can we give it to others? We have to do it first. So that was Prabhupada's plan, yeah. He didn't want us to simply compromise everything in the name of you know, pecuniary or material gain. And that's what everyone's doing. The husband and wife, they get married, and they both go to work because they need money. And I almost saw, I almost saw, I, I was f privy to this directly, a relationship almost completely lost. Somehow it got saved. And it was by God's grace it got saved. That was the situation. The wife just wanted to go to work. <laughs> and the husband needed a wife. He didn't have one. He had a work partner. And that almost destroyed everything. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. I think your point, which you mentioned in today class, morning class also, association, and also, as you mentioned a few minutes back, keeping Krishna in center when husband and wife are serving together. Yeah. I think that, that these means, two points makes the... That means keeping religious principles as the yeah. foundation for everything you do. Because these principles are not only guidelines, they are principles of devotion. Hmm. True Guru Maharaj. Yeah. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Yeah, we're fighting against a, a type of lifestyle that is contrary to spiritual, moral, aesthetic, and even physical well-being. Mm -hmm. The whole society is in the wrong direction. And the devotees become part of that. Somehow, if they're strong, if they've grown up really strong in Krishna consciousness or in, in uh, Vedic cultural values, they somehow or other can maintain. But not everybody is, is not affected. Thank you, Thank you, Maharaj, and thank you to the devotees. Any last minute questions before? Uh, Maharaj, would you like to chant before we end the class, Maharaj? Yeah. Okay. Let me, uh...
Okay.